thank you both for being here, Dr. Weimer, Dr. Cohen, uh, both from the Yale School of Medicine. So uh, we'll just turn it over to you and thanks for being here. Uh, Title today, Low Dose Initiation of Buprenorphine. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna let Dr. Cohen do um, most of the presenting. Um, he's become one of our local experts on this topic and has um, given this talk in some various uh, formats. And I think he does a really good job of presenting. So I wanted you all to have the benefit of him um, presenting to you. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about us. Um, so I'm Melissa Weimer. I'm a associate professor of medicine at Yale um, School of Medicine in the program in addiction medicine. And um, also one of our associate program directors of our fellowship program. We have four fellows per year uh, who rotate through outpatient and inpatient practice. Most of my time is spent in the hospital setting providing addiction medicine consultation, and we refer many of our patients to you. So thank you for being a great community collaborator um, with us. It's really essential that we're able to have great partnerships with our um, OTP colleagues. Um, I used to be a medical director of a um, OTP in Portland, Oregon, when I was um, on faculty at OHSU. So have a real kind of started my career off in an OTP. So I really um, enjoy that environment. Um, so today we're gonna talk to you about how you might um, think about you know, patients who want to transition from methadone to buprenorphine for various reasons. We're gonna talk about the background of that, um, just so you have some understanding of how you might approach that. I recognize that many of your patients may be on methadone currently, so we're gonna discuss how that transition might occur, um, but we'll also talk a little bit about some of the different techniques we're using in the hospitalized setting, that you might be coming across, you might hear your patients talk about. So um, so I'm pleased to uh, present Dr. Cohen. He's a second year addiction medicine fellow. Uh, he will be joining us on faculty in July, uh, doing work in our um, inpatient addiction medicine consult um, service and just has a wealth of information and um, excited to hear his presentation. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction, Melissa, and, and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk with everybody today about low-dose initiation of BUP. Um, I don't have any disclosures. So I, I, I feel like it's always worth kind of coming back to this whenever I uh, want to talk about or talk about a topic that's related to, to addiction medicine is, is how important the language we use it is and how important using person-centered language is. And we know that that impacts kind of the the stigma people feel, whether they're likely or unlikely to actually go to medical care, get connected with treatment and, and OTPs. Um, but, and I think that that actually relates also to kind of the language that we use around kind of this, this, this method that we're gonna talk about low dose initiation of buprenorphine, I think. Um, I think early, early on in the literature, it's often referred to as microdosing of buprenorphine. And I think um, we're trying to avoid that term a little bit more because of the connotation with LSD use and also in the pharmacology literature that it has to do with having subtherapeutic doses of a medication, which we're not trying to do here. We're getting people up to a therapeutic dose. And so throughout the talk, I'll refer to it as low dose initiation. I think there are other terms that are fine too, including micro induction, but um, just as an FYI. So the, the big things that um, we're gonna talk about today are, first, we're gonna just talk a little bit about buprenorphine, kind of how its big properties that uh, kind of lead to precipitated withdrawal, but also kind of underpin its efficacy and safety. Um, we're gonna talk about low dose initiation and how that relates to precipitated withdrawal. And then we'll briefly go through kind of the data on low dose initiation and end with kind of a little bit of a how-to guide on how to actually do it in, in the clinic. Um, so I always like to start, I don't know if we'll see if people get engaged in a poll everywhere, but just to wake everybody up and make sure that kind of everybody's 
um, interested is, I have a question for y'all is, have you ever prescribed or discussed low-dose initiation of buprenorphine? And so there are instructions at the top. You can either text Sean Cohen 442 to 22333, and then whatever your answer is, or you can hop on your computer and just go to uh, the website above. We'll see if this works or not. Well, it's working, that's a good sign. Yeah. So I'll give it another. So it looks like there's a couple people that feel like they, they haven't needed to use low dose initiation before, a couple people that have used it before, which is awesome. And then one one or a couple people who who are still kind of like, what is this? Which is great, because I mean, that's that's what we're here to do is kind of help kind of educate about what this method is and why you would need to use it too, or in what situations it could be helpful. I'm good. A lot of people actually have used it before. So I, again, I think it's worth taking a step back and kind of understanding how buprenorphine works and, and kind of why we start it the way that we do to understand the utility of low dose initiation and how it helps. And so, um, I really think about buprenorphine as having two really key characteristics. Uh, the first characteristic is that it's incredibly high affinity at the opioid receptor. And so that means that it grabs that receptor incredibly tightly and it doesn't let go. Um, that also means that if there's something else on the opioid receptor, um, it will kick that off because the buprenorphine is just so much more attracted to the receptor. And if, there, if someone takes another opioid while they have bup in their system, the buprenorphine kind of hangs onto that receptor and doesn't let that opioid kind of get onto the receptor. And so underpins some of its safety. Um, the other big characteristic is that buprenorphine, unlike methadone, is a partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. And so that means that it only activates that receptor halfway. And I think the analogy that a lot of people use is like, if, if methadone or other fallopioid agonists like heroin or fentanyl are like turning a light completely on, buprenorphine is like a dimmer switch. And so it has enough agonism to hopefully help people not have withdrawal symptoms, not have cravings, but not so much that it comes with the risk of, of overdose. And, and it's really these two properties that come together that cause and, and have the risk of precipitated withdrawal. And so precipitated withdrawal is, is, with, is worsening withdrawal symptoms, significant worsening withdrawal symptoms when starting buprenorphine. And the reason that that happens is if someone has a full opioid agonist, say heroin or fentanyl on their opioid receptors in their system and buprenorphine is started, because it's higher affinity, it wants to get on that opioid receptor more than everything else, it kicks all those full agonists off the receptor. And then because it's only a partial agonist and only partially activates those receptors, it, it, you're at your kind of opioid receptor agonism, the activation in your body goes from 100% to 50% in a matter of kind of seconds to minutes. And that very abrupt shift is what causes these much worsening withdrawal symptoms that we get if we start buprenorphine too early. And, and avoiding precipitated withdrawal is the reason we have kind of our, our, our induction methods, the way that we start buprenorphine. And I think it's important to know that precipitated withdrawal is associated with decreased treatment retention, which is one of our big goals of, of starting this medication and pe keeping people on. And so avoiding it as much as we can is, is really incredibly important. Um, and so the way that we generally start buprenorphine is we have someone stop all full agonists full opioid agonists that they're taking, whether that's, again, non-prescribed things like heroin or fentanyl or prescribed things such as methadone or other full opioid agonists. We wait a pre-specified amount of time. That's for some people, for depending on the opioid, that can be between like 12 hours and, and 72 hours. And we wait for them to have withdrawal symptoms. And that's essentially telling us that enough of the full opioid agonist has now cleared their system, has now gotten off the receptors that it's safe to start buprenorphine. And then we give a dose of bup, and we kind of make sure that they don't feel, feel bad from it. They don't have worsening withdrawal. And then we kind of repeat that dose and slowly up titrate over an effective dose. And so it is a little bit complicated, the process, but I think there are ways to simplify it. And it's been shown to be effective both in the clinic and doing it at home. And just a little plug, there's an app on both the Apple 
Apple App Store and, and the Google Play Store for Android phones called buprenorphine home induction or starting buprenorphine that kind of walks patients through this whole process. Uh, and I think it's a, I've used it a lot in the clinic and found it actually really helpful. But, but there, are, there are situations where stopping, stopping someone's opioids, um, having them wait for withdrawal symptoms, and th only then starting buprenorphine is, just, is really challenging or just not feasible. And I was hoping if anybody has any ideas, if they could share, again, same kind of thing, just text kind of uh, your ideas to that number or respond. Yeah, high dose methanol, great. Um, severe pain. Limited support systems, yeah, that's a good one too. Hmm. So I think we're kind of seeing, so some things about methadone, longer acting opioids, like that transition is difficult. People that are in pain maybe can't stop the opioids for the period that they need withdrawal. And then so, some things about just people not being able to tolerate withdrawal, time constraint, and high risk of overdose. And so you you got, you all kind of hit, and let's see if I can get this, the, the nail on the head for kind of the situations that I, I usually think of too, is meth, transitioning from methadone to buprenorphine. What, what we know from the literature is generally for this to be no, most successful and for people to not have significant precipitated withdrawal, we have to slowly down, down, down titrate someone to 30 milligrams, stop that for a couple of days and then start buprenorphine. And that whole process is a very risky process, obviously, because you're going to a subtherapeutic dose of methadone for that person for a long period of time. There's a lot of risk of overdose during that period or loss to follow up. Um, Someone who's on full opioid agonist, whether that's prescribed or non-prescribed because of significant pain and feels like they just can't stop them during that time. We're seeing more and more in the literature that kind of this uh, illicit or non-prescribed fentanyl um, it, because of its unique, sorry, because of its unique uh, pharmacologic properties, particularly because it, it's very lipophilic, it just hangs around the body a lot longer. It's really unpredictable in how long you have to wait after stopping fentanyl to start a buprenorphine. And then I think like other people said, people that just haven't, aren't able to tolerate withdrawal symptoms, whether that's because of they don't have the support at home because they've had previous unsuccessful to start buprenorphine um, or, or, or because they just don't feel like they can tolerate withdrawal. Those are all situations where starting beep is really, really difficult. And so next we're gonna, I'll actually pause there and see if anybody has any questions before we get into what low dose initiation is and how it works and all those kinds of things. Okay. Um, so, the way that I think about low dose initiation and, and the way that I kind of explain it uh, and that really helped me understand it is, is this analogy of a car speeding down the highway. And so I think about kind of full opioid agonism and whether that's something that's again prescribed like methadone for treatment of opiate use disorder prescribed for pain like um, oxycodone or other, other medications like that or, um, or an opioid that's non-prescribed like heroin or fentanyl. All of those are essentially like a car going 120 miles an hour. Those opioid receptors are fully activated. So the car is kind of pedal to the metal going 120 miles an hour. Buprenorphine, because it's, again, it's only a partial agonist, it only like halfway activates those opioid receptors is like a car going 60 miles an hour instead. And what precipitated withdrawal is, is if someone still has opioids in their system, like methadone again, because the buprenorphine replaces that full opioid agonist in their system when someone starts it, they go from 120 miles an hour to 60 miles an hour in a, in a couple of seconds or a minute, and it feels like they're slamming on the brakes. And that sensation of sudden stopping is precipitated withdrawal, and that's what we want to avoid. And so the way that low dose initiation of buprenorphine works is, is you're starting at the same place. Someone's on some sort of full opioid agonist. And, and for this example, we'll, we'll say it's methadone. 
And on the first day of low dose initiation, you're giving someone a very, very tiny dose of buprenorphine. So 0.5 milligrams. And, and just so everyone's aware, I mean, therapeutic doses we normally think of as something between like 12 and 24 milligrams. So this is really tiny dose of buprenorphine, a quarter of a two milligram strip. So they take that the first day and a little bit of buprenorphine replaces the methadone on the opioid receptors. And so the car slows down just a little bit to 115 miles an hour. And the next day we increase it to 0.5 milligrams twice a day. And so the, a little bit more buprenorphine replaces the methadone at the opioid receptors and the car slows down a little bit more. And each day we bring up the dose just a little bit. And so a little bit more buprenorphine replaces the methadone and the car slows down a little bit more. And we keep doing that day by day until someone gets to a therapeutic dose of buprenorphine. And at that point, all of or most of the opioid receptors in their brain are now saturated with buprenorphine. And so you can stop the methadone without that, hopefully without them going into any withdrawal, but definitely without them going into any severe or significant withdrawal symptom. And this is kind of this, this point is, I think, the big crux of why low dose initiation works and kind of why it's useful. And so I'll, I'll, I'll pause one more time here just to see if anybody has any questions about the analogy or kind of how this works too. Is that generally at home that they're doing the quarter of a strip, a two milligram, or is that something that's dispensed like in a facility? Uh, so I think it depends. I th there, and we'll talk a little bit through the literature. I think people have done it at home and then there are ways to make it easier that we'll talk about for people to do it at home too. Um, and I think you can also do it in facilities. I think most of the literature of like facilities that people have done this in is predominantly in the hospitals. And, and there's like a little bit of a, a, a kink with, within the hospitals is you have to just figure out what formulation of buprenorphine you can use because not all hospitals will let you split up strips. And to get that like 0.5 milligram dose, you always have to either split a strip or use some other formulation of buprenorphine. But, it, but you can do it in both places, both in facilities and at home. I have a question. Do you recommend that the client be on um, a lower dose of methadone, say, at 30 milligrams, or, or can they start doing microdosing at their normal maintenance dose at 100 milligrams, for example? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think the, the big benefit of this is unlike the kind of traditional transitions from methadone to bup, where you have to go down on the methadone doses here, you don't have to. And what we generally explicitly tell people is during this process, you don't want to mess with the full opioid agonist because you don't want to accidentally cause someone to have withdrawal symptoms that then you think is from the buprenorphine and makes things a whole bunch worse. And so we generally keep people on their full dose of methadone until they're on the therapeutic dose of bup and then stop it. And I'll say we've personally done this with people on doses as high as I think like 150 milligrams of methadone. And we took it slow. It took a little bit longer than the seven days that's kind of described here, but they, they, were, they got through it with very minimal withdrawal symptoms and were able to transition successfully. Yeah, I would just add that though we have done it in patients on that high of a dose, we, we do generally really pause and have a pretty extensive conversation before we um, do it at that dose. Usually, I think we've seen patients do best if they're on less than 100 milligrams. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do it at higher. I think you just have to be really, really careful. The times we have seen it not work well is if someone tapered their methadone prior to the transition, mm -hmm. say they were on a dose of 80 milligrams, and then they tapered to a dose of 40 or 30 in a period of a couple days, and then we did the low dose transition, those patients do not seem to do as well. So if the patient is in any sort of withdrawal from their prior dose, that really affects their ability to, to transition. Um, I wish we had tons of more than just anecdotal evidence about this, but this is kind of where the evidence is right now. Um, so you can do it at higher than 100. You just really want to be really mindful and patient. It might take patients a little longer and they may not tolerate it as well. And I guess at, at what point would you fully transition someone off of, say, their methadone dose? Yeah, so I think the I think that's a question that hasn't like really been truly answered by the literature yet. I think generally we when someone gets up to 16 milligrams of bup, which is usually around seven days into this process, we usually transition people off. 
um, just stop the methadone then and haven't had people have withdrawal symptoms after that. I think again, in that one, that one case that we did where the patient was on 150, we, we were pretty certain that she was going to need 24 milligrams of bup. And so we didn't stop the methadone until we got her to 24, just because again, we were trying to be extra cautious, particularly with that high of a methadone dose. I'll say some of the literature, like people stop the methadone or stop the opioids at like 12 milligrams. I, I, I feel like waiting till 16 is probably, it's, it's probably the safest thing to do in terms of just like waiting for a little bit of a higher dose. But. And you would maintain their, their same methadone dose? Like you wouldn't taper it throughout that process as well? Yeah, I wouldn't taper it at all throughout that process. And again, I think the main reason is I mean, both our experience and seeing that people who have had their methadone doses tapered just prior or during this process are the people that really get severe withdrawal symptoms and don't do well. And also the idea is, is kind of like, you don't want to mess with kind of their equilibrium at this point of how much opioid they need to maintain themselves and not have withdrawal. And if you reduce the methadone during this process, and then someone starts to have withdrawal symptoms, the question is always going to be, is that from the methadone reduction? Is that from the bup? Like, do we continue on? Do we not continue? And it, it just kind of muddies the waters a lot. Awesome. I would also say that um, patients find this approach somewhat trippy, if you will. They're sort of like, you want me to do what? You want me to stay on my methadone dose while you're going to start buprenorphine. So there's a lot of patient education and support that goes into it. Many of our transitions, you know, the ones that we're doing on the higher doses, we are doing in the inpatient setting. So we're able to monitor hospital setting. We're able to monitor patients on a daily basis and really respond to their concerns and questions. Um, Dr. Cohen's done this in the outpatient setting as well, um, where you may not have the same ability to follow them as closely. Um, but I do think that you have to be really clear with people that they need to maintain a stable dose to the extent possible. Because once you start changing doses, you really create chaos within this very kind of somewhat tenuous um, transition. And so you just really want to be clear with them that they've got to follow the process really to a T. If someone is continuing to abuse illicit substances such as fentanyl or cocaine, how does that affect this process? Yeah. So I think, I mean, the, I don't, I don't think of the cocaine is affecting things as much, except that, I mean, it does definitely cause like increase in methadone metabolism and things like that, but I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think about that as much going into this process, but if someone is using kind of non-prescribed substances, fentanyl or heroin during this, if they're on methadone, I, I basically tell them that whatever you were using for the past couple of days, you should try to continue using an, at, a, at a relatively steady rate during the time that you're going through this initiation. And kind of for the same reasons is you don't want to just drop the amount of opioids they're taking and then them go into withdrawal from that attributed to the buprenorphine and this not work out. But that's also like a relatively difficult conversation, I think, for us to wrap our heads around a little bit too, is for someone who's using non-prescribed opioids, whether that's fentanyl or heroin during this, you're essentially telling them, we want you, I want you to, for these seven days to get you onto buprenorphine to continue using whatever you've been using consistently and, and going through kind of that harm reduction too, of making sure like they know all this, like they have a consistent dealer, hopefully they do it using fentanyl test strips, doing test shots, have kind of clean needles and all the things to keep them safe during the process too. But that was, a, I think is always a difficult conversation and was a difficult concept for us to wrap our heads around too at the beginning. I think that also speaks to the fact that we don't necessarily expect them to stop their use during this process because we are, particularly if they're, say they're not on methadone, they're, they're, they're initiating buprenorphine um, from the use of heroin or fentanyl. We know that the doses we're giving are not going to be sufficient to treat craving or to stop opioid use. So you kind of have to be realistic about the fact that they're still going to have withdrawal symptoms. We're not treating those withdrawal symptoms until they get to a, 
a higher stable dose of buprenorphine. Um, so in a way, you're being somewhat pragmatic or realistic about the fact that until you get to a higher dose of buprenorphine, we don't necessarily expect that there's going to be a reduction of opioid use. Is there any trick to the timing of when the person should take the full opiate versus the buprenorphine? Like I have patients ask me if they should wake up in the morning and do they come to the clinic and take the methadone first or they take the dose of the bup first? Yeah, that is a that is a, an area that I honestly, I've thought about a lot and we just don't have an answer to. I think uh, I haven't, I haven't had people specifically like come back and say that one way works better for them or not, but I, I really don't have a lot of uh, guidance on it. I, I would, my, my like inclination is to say, particularly with methadone is that they probably take the methadone first, mm -hmm. just so that they have that full agonist in their system, like at, at its usual day, dose while they're, while they're doing this transition. Um, but that is complete opinion, not, not based on any actual literature. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I would say in general, in the hospital, we typically recommend that they get their dose of, if they're prescribed methadone on a stable dose, that they're getting their methadone in the morning, having that in their system, and then giving the buprenorphine an hour or so later. You could give it at the exact same time, technically, um, but I generally do think that it kind of makes more sense to give the full agonist and then follow it with the lower dose partial agonist. So we're, we're generally recommending that. Um, some people do totally fine regardless of which you give when. It, this is kind of a very interesting situation in that there are select patients who sail through these these transitions, like sale, like you would never recognize or realize that they're transitioning. And there are other patients who really struggle. And the patients who struggle seem to be those who have a lot of anxiety. They don't necessarily buy into the transitional approach. They're scared of it. Um, and then folks who are utilizing concomitant benzodiazepines, I think that speaks to the anxiety component those patients have tended to do less well with this transition approach. Do you have any like long-term results from these studies? Like are people, once they get stabilized, are they maintaining their sobriety? Are they continuing to use illicit unprescribed drugs? Yeah, I think all the, the, the literature to date is all case reports and some retrospective chart reviews, but, and, and we're, at, that's kind of the next section of this, but there is, there's not longer term literature yet on how people do after the transition. And, and then Dr. Cohen, what do you recommend for people that are abusing benzodiazepines and or alcohol? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a tough issue. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, I don't think that that, like Dr. Weimer said, I think that that often speaks to like some underlying anxiety too. And so I think we, we've we seen that the process is a little more difficult or tolerated a little bit less, but I think, I almost think of it as, I mean, they're, they're obviously interrelated issues, but that they're also a little bit separate issues is that we should be addressing their benzodiazepine use as we typically do and trying to treat the underlying causes and whether that's trying to uh, prescribe some benzodiazepines and do a taper or getting them into some other treatment and same with the alcohol, trying to make sure that they're not actively going through alcohol withdrawal during this process. Um, but, but I don't, yeah, I don't have any additional insights other than that. Okay. Thank you. Question. So when the patient gets a therapeutic dose, um, with the buprenorphine and they're take and they're stopping the methadone, are you stopping that gradually or are you tapering them off or it's just, you're just taking them off the methadone and do they have precipitation withdrawal then? Or is that what a lot of patients are scared of? Or is there something else that we're doing to, to assist them and let them know that they will not, because this could be a deterrent for them? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what we, in, in our practice, we have just stopped the methadone at this point when they're and, and with the idea that when you get to 16 or 24 milligrams of buprenorphine, like 
over 90% of your opioid receptors in your brain have bup on them. And so the methadone at that point isn't really doing anything to those receptors. Um, and we've had success with that. But I, I agree with you that a lot of the, I think a lot of the importance of this process is expectation setting. Cause I think the one thing that I hear from most when I bring this up to patients as an option, they're like, but the one thing that I know is that I cannot take buprenorphine while taking other opioids at the same time. Like I've done that, it's horrible. Or like, I've heard that that's just the one thing you can't do. And so really taking the time before you start to pro the process to talk through kind of what's expected that and kind of why this works the way it does. And I, I genuinely use this same analogy with patients to kind of walk them through how it works too. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe in the interest of time, we can keep going. And I think some of these questions will get, get answered. Yeah, and so I just want to step back. Like the reason that we're choosing to do low dose initiation, right, is is, is a lot of it is because it's a patient centered approach. Some people just really cannot tolerate their withdrawal symptoms or have had their withdrawal symptoms and um, before and just can't get onto buprenorphine that way. But it also enables clinicians to be able to start buprenorphine in people in a safer way for some people and in, a, and in some people that we just haven't been able to start them before. And so in the hospital, we often use this when someone's on opioids for acute pain that's just had a surgery on their heart or just broken some bone and needed a surgery where we can't stop full agonists and we wouldn't be able to get them on buprenorphine previously. And I think in terms of methadone, it facilitates a faster and safer transition because you don't have to taper the methadone beforehand. So there's less of that risk of recurrence of use or loss to follow up during that taper process. So I'm gonna briefly go through the literature on this and then we'll really get to the meat of like, how do we act? How do you actually do this in the clinical setting? And so the, the literature is pretty sparse to be honest. It's mostly case reports, case series, a couple of retrospective chart reviews. Um, and it's about 30 publications in total. And, and truthfully, almost all of them focus on successful episodes of this, as you'd kind of expect in the published literature. Um, the first case of this ever being published is, is back in 2010. I think, I think it's in, it was called the Bernese method, uh, same kind of thing. You can see buprenorphine doses over here in this table on the right and heroin doses right next to it of, of what that person was taking. Um, and as they gradually increase the buprenorphine dose, they actually gradually reduce their heroin. And this person was successfully able to transition to buprenorphine that hadn't been able to do it before. Um, this case, along with another case, was actually republished in the, in the, in the uh, English uh, medical literature. Um, and and I, I just like this chart from the second case in that series because I think it really illustrates well what, how the process works. Um, you can see this little dotted line is, is the full opioid agonist dose over here in morphine equivalents. And this dashed line is the buprenorphine dose. And you can see they keep this, the full agonist dose. And for this patient, they were in a different, another country where they had more options to treat opiate use disorder. So they were on methadone, but also on diacetylmorphone or, or prescription heroin. And you can see they keep that dose really consistent throughout the entire process as they're slowly bringing up this buprenorphine dose for this patient over 30 days. And the patient has pretty minimal withdrawal symptoms throughout that entire process. Just to briefly say there, there are other formulations essentially that you can use to start this process. There's a couple of case reports about using the buprenorphine or butrans patch to do it, although um, it's pretty inconsistent in how, how much patch you use and, and kind of what the methods are. And then most recently, there's really been a focus on cases either in the hospital where there's been a lot of case reports, case series, and two retrospective chart reviews that have kind of just all had a, a little bit of a different flavor of, of the exact method of doing it. Some were quicker of doing it over two or three days because of hospital formulation issues. People had to use either sublingual that they cut up, buccal buprenorphine, which is what actually we use at Yale and what Dr. Weimer has kind of uh, innovated on, and then IV buprenorphine is, is used at some institutions. Um, and people have transitioned from methadone, prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl. And in the literature so far, there haven't been a lot of episodes of significant withdrawal described from this process. And then lastly, there've been about 10 publications or 
of, of this being successful in the outpatient setting as well. And I, I like this picture coming from one of them because it, it really shows you the slow increase. They start at 0.25 milligrams, which I don't think we have to start that low, but the slow increase in buprenorphine dose over the course of, of a week to get somebody onto, onto buprenorphine in this method. And so lastly, and kind of the meat of everything is, is I wanna talk a little bit about how, how we actually do this. And so I think there are, the literature again is very case-based and also kind of, uh, the, again, every case has a little bit of a different flavor in how they do it. But I think there are principles that you can, we can glean from the literature to help kind of make this process as successful as possible and help, help get people through it. Um, first of all, is I think choosing, choosing the, appropriate clinical situation to use low dose initiation. If someone is presenting to you, they're already in withdrawal symptoms and they haven't used any opioids in, in hours or days, like that's not the person that I'm gonna do a low dose initiation with. That person can get start on buprenorphine the standard way and a low dose is just gonna drag out a process that doesn't need to be dragged out. The people that I'm really thinking about doing low dose initiation are people that are on methadone that I wanna trans, that want to transition to buprenorphine for whatever reason that they want to. Um, people that have not tolerated starting buprenorphine before. And then again, people that are on, on, it, on met opioids for acute pain or chronic pain and just aren't able to stop them for a long enough period to be able to, to start buprenorphine. The second principle is, is really starting low. And this kind of ties in with the third principle too and, and gradual up titration is that, like, the idea is, is that you want to use small doses of buprenorphine that gradually increase. So you're only replacing a little bit of the full opioid agonist on the opioid receptors eat with each dose increase. And then we kind of, we, we talked about this a lot too, but con continuing the full agonist throughout the process. And so, it, it, honestly, it's a lot easier if someone is transitioning from methadone because they have a stable full, ag, full opioid agonist dose. We have done it with people that are transitioning just from kind of the, the, the street drug supply from fentanyl or heroin. And, and again, that conversation is, is a, a little, uh, I think, trippy, both for us and for the patients of us saying like, here are the ways to be safe and using a very unsafe drug supply. But while you're doing this transition, you should try to use it as consistently as possible. So you're not going into significant withdrawal. I think one of the most important things is, is this process is, as you can tell by us talking about it, it can be super helpful, but it also is a little complicated. You have to change doses of buprenorphine each day. It involves cutting up strips. And so clear and frequent communication. I think setting, setting expectations before this process is started and then checking in at least every two, three days if possible with the patient to see how it's going and troubleshooting if they have any withdrawal symptoms is incredibly important. I don't think all those visits have to be in person. They can definitely, I think telehealth, the, the ability of telehealth to really broaden our, our ability to, to see people and evaluate people and help people, I think can be used in this situation too. In the case of someone having some withdrawal symptoms, it's pretty rare that we've had somebody who goes into really severe withdrawal symptoms from this, unless they're, again, have stopped their full opioid agonist or something else is going on. I think more often we see that people start to start to have like really some subtle signs of withdrawal, like they feel like they can't stop moving their legs or they start to have a little bit of pyloerection or something that they just feel like is their withdrawal symptom, but it's mild. And in those cases, what I usually tell people to do is whatever dose they took that day to just repeat it again the next day and let their body equilibrate, e equilibrate a little bit um, before starting to gradually increase the dose again. And then I think lastly, and then this is true for just all of kind of medical care, but care coordination here is particularly critical. I mean, particularly, I think for people that are on methadone, making sure that if they're at a different OTP, which hopefully won't be the case, that, that that place is aware of what's going on and so that the methadone can be continued throughout the process. Because I think the worst case scenario is starting this process, having the methadone all of a sudden stop because someone wasn't aware of what was going on and saw buprenorphine on the PMP and then that patient going into really severe withdrawal and being lost to follow up. And so making sure, again, you're talking with everybody you can before starting this process. And so the, the real how-to, and this is a method that we use at, at Yale Hospital, although we use, again, we use a different formulation of buprenorphine, but this is kind of the gradual increase that we generally do is we start on day one with 0.5 milligrams of buprenorphine once. Um, on day two, we go up to that twice a day. The third day, we go up to one milligram twice a day, and then two milligrams twice a day, and then four milligrams twice a day. 
and then three times a day, and then up to eight milligrams. And you're continuing the full agonist throughout those first six days. And then when they get to a therapeutic dose of eight milligrams BID on day seven is when you stop the dose. And, and the whole beginning process can be done with the two milligram strips in the outpatient setting, but the patient will have to cut up the strips into quarters to be able to use it. And so I think troubleshooting, I think as with any BUP initiation, prescribing adjuncts like clonidine, loperamide, ibuprofen, all those kinds of things in case someone has withdrawal symptoms. I think in some cases where we've had somebody who's just very anxious about the process and didn't have a benzodiazepine use disorder, we have prescribed some kind of short courses of low dose benzodiazepines to just help them kind of get through the process and, and have been successful at that. Um, I think as much as possible, trying to simplify what is a relatively complex process for the patient. So I think getting them a Mediset kind of walking them through how to cut up the actual strips and what the dose is each day can be super helpful. And one of the things that we've been able to do um, at Clinic and the App Foundation is partner with a local community pharmacy with Hancock to actually bubble pack a starter kit that has the entire one week kind of low dose initiation protocol all in one bubble pack. So the person can just pop out each, each dose that they need each day and doesn't have to worry about cutting up strips or, or splitting, splitting tabs. And just to simplify it for everybody, this is a, the QR code in the bottom you can throw your phone up to and, and, and the camera up to, and it'll bring you to a Google doc of this. But this is a dosing guide that we created to help in the outpatient setting to help kind of guide patients and clinicians through the process of the low dose initiation that uh, you can see kind of in the columns are the days of the process. And then in the rows is which dose of the day it is. And so on day one, you can see it's a quarter of a two milligram strip that they just take in the morning. In day two, it's a quarter of a milligram strip in the morning and a quarter in the evening and so on. And it walks you through each day of the process. And so those are the, so the, I think the big take home points that I hope people got out of this is, is how buprenorphine works as a high affinity partial agonist, um, that abrupt shift from full agonism to partial agonism. If you start buprenorphine while someone has full agonist in their system, to, system is what causes precipitated withdrawal. And low dose initiation is an effective way to reduce the risk of precipitated withdrawal. Um, but it is a bit of a complex process, but there are ways to simplify it a little bit. And the Bernese method, which is that method of gradually increasing doses is the most common method described in the literature. Um, and again, we're he definitely here for questions. These are just a couple of resources for everybody on the left is basically this lecture, except in a Twitter version of it that just walks you through kind of um, each of these steps that we talked through. In the middle is an article that, that Dr. Weimer and myself published that kind of talks through everything that we talked through today, as well as kind of the troubleshooting aspects and kind of gives some helpful tips and, and practical guidance around doing this both in the clinic and in the, in the hospital setting. And then on the right is that one pager that has that dosing guide. And you can just hold your phone again, up the camera up to any of these, and it should bring you to a website that has each of these available for you. Well, thank you. Um... I guess, you know, we'll open it up to questions if anybody has one. I think this was an excellent presentation. I found it very helpful. Uh, so thank you both. Um, opening it up to the group, is, does anyone have any questions for either Dr. Cohen or Dr. Weimer? I'm thinking about um, really helpful and informative um, discussion. So thank you so much. But with the full agonist, um, like, especially in the outpatient setting where we're saying, like, continue, it seems like a really scary conversation to have yeah. about, you know, continue to use. And I was curious in the hospital, are you giving full agonists? And then I guess in the outpatient setting, would we consider being like, you know what, let's give you methadone in instead of saying, like, especially with all the fentanyl on the streets and stuff, how are you guys approaching that in the hospital? Yeah, in the hospital, we're, we're essentially doing our best to replace whatever full agonist they are taking. So we're either giving them like something short acting like oxycodone or hydromorphone, or in some cases, giving them some methadone and some short acting opioids to get them to kind of, again, that equilibrium point where they're not having withdrawal symptoms that then we know that we can 
transitions them with low dose safely. Um, in the outpatient setting, I completely agree with you. It, it's a terrifying prospect to tell someone to use this very toxic and kind of lethal street drug supply for an additional, even, I mean, for, in this case, we usually do it for seven days, but even for one day, it seems like a scary thing to do. Um, we, I think you can definitely start methadone to do this process, but I think it, it becomes that same thing of like, when you're starting methadone at 30 milligrams, like what percent of people actually have their cravings and withdrawal symptoms relieved by 30 milligrams? I, I imagine it's, and in my experience, it's incredibly low. And so they're gonna still have withdrawal symptoms during that process and we'll still be using during that process too. And so I think it's fine to start methadone during that time. And, but they're also probably gonna be using some sort of kind of, again, street opioid too, to kind of make sure they're at an equilibrium point. In, I'll say in Canada, uh, the, the beacon of hope that is Canada, they're, they're, they do some, they like prescribe sustained release oral morphine during this process and get someone on a stable dose beforehand. But unfortunately, uh, legally, we are not allowed to prescribe full opioid agonists for the treatment of opiate use disorder at this point in the United States. And so it's unfortunately just not an option in the United States. Yeah, I, think, I would say practic sorry, go, go ahead. I was just going to say it, it also, I think it gives you like this, another opportunity to really walk through how some, how to stay sa safe as possible while using, using this kind of, again, very toxic drug supply of walking through kind of how someone uses, how they can avoid infections, making sure they're connected with the needle exchange, have Narcan, use with someone in the room, have a consistent supply and all those things. And so I think it's always important to emphasize that during these conversations too. Yeah, I think you also have to use clinical judgment. So is this someone you think who is going to be able to follow through with what is a very complex dosing regimen when you think about our you know usual dosing regimens is a very complex dosing regimen that they really have to follow very very closely um so if you don't feel that they're in a safe place where they're going to be able to reliably take the medication or their drug supply or their their access to resources to continue their drug use is stable enough you know it's probably somebody that you would say i think we need to stabilize you on methadone for a couple days i would say three to five days recognizing that you're not you know you're not committing them to methadone you're just stabilizing them so that they're safe and then start the initiation of buprenorphine at that say three to five day mark. And the reason I say wait a little bit that three to five days is because you do, you want the full agonist to be in their body. Um, again, cause we're talking about that full agonist has to be relatively at steady state. And we know that it takes time for methadone to get to steady state. And we also know that when someone's in active withdrawal, you know, they're, they're potentially having the, you know, ongoing use on top of the methadone. So give them a couple of days, stabilize them. If this is somebody who you don't think is gonna have the supports to do this complex regimen with a relatively unstable um, drug supply and then start the low dose initiation and they're, they're probably more likely to do well. We do have, in some ways, the, the bias of the hospital setting where we really control for the most part. Obviously, patients can take substances in the hospital. We recognize that. But we do have a bit more control about what's going into the patient's body as far as the full agonist in the hospital. So, um, so I think that makes these transitions I don't want to say necessarily easier, but a bit more predictable in that setting, as opposed to the outpatient setting where you really are more reliant on the patient following through with, like I said, a relatively complex dosing regimen. Yeah. Dr. Weimer and uh, Dr. Cohen, I'm sorry, I missed if you were Dr. Russell. I just had a quick question and Dr. Weimer, you just started to answer it. Who might be candidate for this? So is it going to be driven by the client or is this more of a clinically driven conversation? I'm just curious. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's both. I, I think for people that want to trans, for people that are like saying oh, saying they want to transition from methadone to bup, I, I think that this method is much easier than the and much safer than the alternative of like slowly tapering the dose, then having to wait for withdrawal symptoms and then doing it. I think for people that are kind of using the the street currently using the street drug supply and not on um, some form of MOUD or OAT. Um, those people, I, th I think it's, it's kind of both. It's, I think there are some people that, some people that are going to come and say, like, I've tried to be on, I've tried to get on buprenorphine before. I just haven't had success. I keep going into withdrawal symptoms and I, and methadone just doesn't work for my lifestyle. And, and so those people are, are people that I'll definitely talk to. And then I think there's, there are some people that I think from a clinician perspective, you think this might work better for too. And I, I'm generally, if someone, my, I think the area where that needs more expansion mostly is, is people that are just using fentanyl and on, almost only fentanyl is, again, we're seeing more and more cases of precipitated withdrawal. And I don't know, at least in the literature, and I think we've seen that personally too. I don't know if all of you have too, and starting BUP for people that are just using fentanyl and how do we safely transition those people, I think is still a discussion to be had, but I think low dose initiation can play a big role if if kind of the classic initiation hasn't worked for them before. Yeah, I would definitely say it's, it, there's a lot of factors. I think it should be driven, it should be a you know, patient-centered conversation to lay out the various ways to initiate buprenorphine. Um, so I think patients should have choice. That being said, you have to think about resource, um, you know, your resources, the patient's resources, all these various factors. And, and so that can also dictate whether you truly can offer it. For instance, our current, our current transition takes approximately five to seven days. So these are hospitalized patients. So when we're thinking about this with patients, we also have to take into account, is this a patient who's actually going to be in the hospital for five to seven days? So if it's somebody who's getting discharged the next day, we don't, we don't really offer it. We don't put it on the table, at least as far as starting it in the hospital. We may connect them to ongoing care and say, this isn't something we're gonna be able to help you with in the hospital you need to continue your methadone or if that's the situation and connect to the outpatient setting where they will guide you through this process. Um, so I think that's the value of having, just recognizing that there are gonna be other constraints that will dictate whether you can offer this to people. Um, I think the issue of you know, having the bubble packs and having the formulations set up and all of that really also dictates the success of this. It took us, I don't know, many months to come to the place where we were able to identify buccal buprenorphine as the initial formulation we were going to use for starting this on days one through three, because our hospital formulary would not allow us to quarter buprenorphine. And so we, we really had to think very creatively to determine how can we provide these super low doses. Um, so in the hospital setting, we, we can give buccal buprenorphine for a patient with opioid use disorder and we're not, we're not regulated. You know, there's not a regulation that tells us we can't do that. However, in the outpatient setting, because of the Harrison Act, you can't use buccal buprenorphine. You can't use butrans patches. You can't use MS content for patients with um, opioid use disorder. So that, that limits your, your options. So I would say if it's something that you, your um, clinics want to consider, I would think about initiating it or, or offering it to relatively stable patients, maybe your patients who've been on methadone for a really long time and they've gotten down to a pretty low dose, like 40, 50 milligrams, and they maybe have struggled to transition to buprenorphine and offer this to them because they're stable and they've got hopefully, you know, enough stability and resources to follow through with the regimen. 
they're likely to do really well. I wouldn't, when I'm starting, I wouldn't start with say your hardest patient because <laughs> it's, it's gonna be, it's just gonna inherently be challenging. And, and I have to also say, Dr. Cohen knows this, like we have had people who haven't succeeded with these transitions. And like I said, those are the people who have, you know, the higher anxiety, the higher use of benzos and alcohol and other substances, those who are less stable in general, they, they, they really struggle. So I would pick relatively stable people to start with until you get more comfortable. And in the hospital, I assume you're doing like a cow scale or like, you know, the visual analog scale or something to um, see how they're doing with withdrawals in the outpatient setting. Or you just like think, call me if, um, you know, you're having these kinds of symptoms or are you saying like, come back in and we'll kind of do an assessment or what's your recommendation there? I think, yeah, I think it depends on what, I, I don't think they have to generally come. I feel like people are pretty good at identifying when they're having withdrawal symptoms, honestly, better than a cow score or anything like that. And so I, I think that it's, it depends on, on whether they can come in. I, I wouldn't limit this. If someone was like, you know, I really can't come in every two days to check. I'd be like, okay, let's do it over the phone. And like, if you start to worry that some of these symptoms are withdrawal symptoms, again, we kind of slow down the process. Um, but I do, I think like ideally I, I like to check in with people after a couple of days, like two or three days of this process. And then in another two or three days at minimum checking with them on day, checking in with them on day six before they transition off the full agonist. But ideally I think more frequently than that. So um, I'll put my email in the chat as well. And you've got Dr. Cohen's email there. Certainly feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, I'll just put a few plugs in for um, the Yale Addiction Medicine or Program in Addiction Medicine. We have a Grand Round series um, that's freely and accessible to anyone in the community. Um, so you can, um, get access to our listserv as well as our grand rounds, which occur every, the second Tuesday, or sorry, the second Thursday of every month from two to 3 p.m., but you can find information on our website, the Yale Program in Addiction Medicine. And usually those are really excellent um, kind of cutting edge uh, addiction topics, and we'd be happy to have any of you join. Um, and again, we really appreciate and value your partnership with, um, with us in the hospital, accepting our patients. I know that we send some challenging patients to you <laughs> from time to time. So we appreciate the, the partnership. Now, likewise, our clinical team really appreciates everything that you do. We look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Um, so thank you very much and we'll be in touch.